I got something to hand out. Since it would be very difficult to figure out my outline, I decided to give it to you. <laughs> uh, and I did want to say a couple of things about about that <laughs> in general. Uh, this is a beta test course. This is only the second time I've uh, tried to teach this course. The last time was like I mean, maybe large hamsters or something, um, so far as that goes. Um, and I don't know, I've, t I've told people that I don't know of anyone who teaches a course on codes and standards at a university. So I'm going to want your feedback on whether this was a worthwhile endeavor um, at the end of this. But what happened last fall is um, I'd been dealing with several problems, and I'll actually talk about one of them today. And I realized that a lot of the problems that you face out there have nothing to do with the calculus you take and things like that. It's basically people don't understand how codes and standards works, how, how purchase orders work, what do you do when you have conflicts, you know, and stuff. So that's one of the reasons for doing it. And you can say, you might say, as I was thinking about it this morning, you might say, well, um, why do we spend the time going through observables and measurements and still don't have any chalk um, and things like that uh, at the beginning of this and does anyone know the difference between a <coughs> standard reference material and a standard I wouldn't expect you to, but I'm asking if you. So no one does. Yeah. Um, well, that's close. Um, a standard is something like an ASTM standard. I handed out the the one yesterday or the day before, or whatever, for a seamless carbon pipe. Okay, and we're going to go through some of that today. But a standard reference material actually is a NIST term. NIST is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, which is down in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, and um, they're also located in Boulder, Colorado. These are the folks that run the uh, atomic clock out in Boulder, Colorado that keeps time for the United States, right? Uh, so they have a standard reference time machine. Oh, a time machine. Ooh, we can go way back. Um, anyway, they have a, a standard reference time machine, and you can you can log on to it. You can buy a watch that uh, will synchronize with it and everything. I have a clock, and I have about five clocks at home that you know synchronize with that. There's one in my office, but it doesn't synchronize because building two is in the way. Okay, um, so I have to take it home to get it synchronized. But generally, you know, that clock after it gets synchronized doesn't lose more than a few seconds in six months on its course movement uh, that's still there. Anyway, a reference material, these are definitions that come off the NIST website. If you look up standard reference materials, this is what NIST will take you. Well, one of the things, it will give you a bunch of definitions. A reference material is material sufficiently homogeneous and stable with certain properties. So a standard reference material <coughs> could be those Johansson blocks I showed you that are accurate to 50 millionths of an inch in length. They're ground. That's a material. It's a physical, tangible object that is homogeneous and is this is traceable back to something. So that's a reference material, not a standard reference material, it's a, a reference material. Um, a standard is usually a document, a piece of paper, as opposed to a material. Now, other standard reference materials um, are uh, hardness test blocks. I could have gotten one out of the lab, but just a little piece of steel that has been manufactured in a very rep reproducible way, so it's uni that's, uh, got uniform properties, and you can take your hardness tester in your laboratory, and you can do the hardness indentation, 
and it will say, you can check and see if your hardness tester is giving you a, a number within the specified limits of that little hardness test block. That's a reference material. If you go down here, certified reference materials and standard reference, NIST standard reference material. Okay, NIST, okay, that's registered, um, trademark. In any case, NIST has a business of selling these things. Unfortunately, the government will not allow them to sell it at a profit, so they have to sell it at cost. So it's something that the Department of Commerce doesn't really like to do, but they have to do because we need something for mass, length, time, uh, chemistry, hardness. Uh, when I looked online this morning, they had standard frozen urine specimens, okay, that have certain toxic levels of mercury and other things. So if you're going to measure for mercury or lead in someone's urine, you have to have a standard. You know, if you're going to go out there and sue the, the person that your child got mercury poisoning because you rented an apartment here in Cambridge and your child ate the lead paint and now your child is stupid because because he ate the lead paint. It has nothing to do with the lead paint. It has to do with genetics. That's why your child is stupid. Okay, <laughs> but but nonetheless. Uh, pardon me? <laughs> um, in any case, people will get that you have to have a standard to measure it to. Okay, and these these other standards, these paper standards, essentially call out measurement tests and things. So these two things fit together. Standard reference materials and standards fit together. The standards are the, the documents, the piece of papers that tell you the procedures, the test, the properties, the mass length, time, magnetic property, whatever the things are. So the reason I've kind of gone through properties and I've gone through measurements is because these things call these things out. These standards call these out and you have to understand where they come from. You also have to have a way to measure them. Remember I started out with Lord Kelvin. If you can't measure it and put numbers on it, you don't know anything about it. Well, you have to have these in order to measure to see if you conform to that standard. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the problem is we, most people in the world, unless you go to NIST, where these people live and breathe standards, they, most people just say, they'll talk about a standard, a hardness standard. We don't say a hardness certified reference standard material. But if you use the word standard at NIST and use it improperly, they will say, oh no, that's a reference standard. Okay? Because they live and breathe this. Okay? But the rest of the world doesn't. And so there's a lot of confusion when people use the terminology, just use the word standard. Okay, so that's, that's one point for today, okay, uh, so far as that goes. Um, so anyway, I, I actually did this outline last fall <coughs> of this, th I actually had my secretary type this up yesterday <coughs> when I was looking at my, my notes for today, what was I going to say? And we had gone through some of these things. We went through history yesterday, who writes the codes? Well, um, Benjamin Franklin did a test, and then I gave you that paper, I don't know if any of you had a chance to read it, how other people started saying, oh, you should do this, and uh, I think the city of Philadelphia started suggesting that people have lightning rods on their houses, and then it moved up through the 1800s, and people learned things. Michael Faraday came along and taught people scientifically about Faraday cages, and frankly, if you look at uh, lightning protection system for a home today, it's nothing more than putting a bunch of metal straps around your house with a terminal at the top to try to make a Faraday cage around your house. Your house. Everybody know what a Faraday cage is? Anybody? Anybody know? Yes. Uh, we had one on a <coughs> missile handling building yeah. in Georgia, but it was to prevent sort of radiation getting out. Well, radiation. So for communication purposes, basically. Right. You can't the right, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, well, if you try to use a cell phone inside a galvanized steel building, it's very difficult because you're inside the Faraday cage. The radiation on the outside can't get in past the metal. Michael Faraday learned that a cage, and it could be like a bird cage, 
the radiation on the outside, the elect electromagnetic radiation can't get to the inside and anything on the inside can't get to the outside. If the spacing between the, the uh, wires on the bird cage are small enough so the bird can't get out, then depending on the frequency and the distance and stuff. If you want to see a big Faraday cage, you go over to the Science Museum where they have the lightning show and they have these big bird cages about two stories tall and inside they have a Van de Graaff generator to generate lightning, but you're, everybody's safe standing there about 100 feet from lightning bolts because the bolt is inside the Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is just a me metallic enclosure. Many of your computers well, actually laptop computers, usually they have a metal case. Even if they don't have a metal case, the plastic case probably has metal powder molded into it to make a Faraday cage, okay, for noise rejection and stuff. You were doing it for communications protection. Yeah, you were just four towers yeah. with cables right. strung between them. So, and it wasn't, I mean, it's just a simple X between them, so probably 300 yards or so from yep. one tower to the other and then one going the other way. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some good scientific ways to design these things for different frequencies, okay, and stuff. But in any case, it's just a metal enclosure, and actually one of Maxwell's equations describes why it works. Basically, he talks about the charge included inside a circular integral, you know, if you want to get back to your inner... If you look at the integral form of Maxwell's equations, and you start looking at where the electric field is, it will tell you that there is no field inside a volume that doesn't have a charge inside, okay? Anyway, uh, so there's different ways to do it, but Michael Faraday first discovered uh, the principle of a Faraday cage back in the early 1800s, which was before lightning systems, or it was after lightning systems and Ben Franklin. Anyway, so historically, you know, there's that little paper that tells you about how lightning protection system standard went through, and I mentioned the Iowa S State Fire Marshal in 1926, and they had all this data on lightning storms and, and burning down barns and stuff. Um, so there's a history to these things. So we've talked a little bit about the boiler and pressure vessel code, and it came up because they were having serious loss of property and life because steam boilers were blowing up on a fairly regular basis. Uh, they still blow up, but not on as regular a basis. A lot of this started out for service, but I also brought up last time that in the last 15 or 20 years we switched to a for-profit on the not-for-profit and, not, and for-profit folks, which is down here. There are scopes and limitations um, to these uh, standards, and we talked about that. I, didn't, I don't think I put this one up. I think I put the boiler and pressure vessel up, but Number one in almost all the ASTM standards is scope, and this specification covers. Those three words are the beginning of almost every standard, okay? So it defines the limitations of the code. There's also fair use, okay, and which I'm not sure I could point you to any text that discusses this, but for example, I didn't bring it with me, but Section 9 of the Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, which I th think I brought in one day, you know, it's a document about this thick. Uh, actually, the real document's about um, 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, but all the appendices and addenda and everything else makes it about an inch and a half thick. In any case, Section 9 of the Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code is welder's qualifications and certification, okay, so far as that goes. Um, and the scope for the boiling pressure vessel code is only applies to boilers. And I showed you the scope of that yesterday. It excludes human occupied vessels, you know, uh, extra uh, pressure vessels. It um, excludes hot water tanks for your home. You know, you know, it doesn't include everything. I told you about the DOT cement tra tank trucks, and it actually didn't exclude those, because, but the people thought that the DOT covered that and, and stuff. Um, it turns out, <coughs> under the uh, scope, even though something doesn't come under the code, doesn't mean that Section 9, which tells you how to do a very good job of certifying and qualifying welders, isn't a good manufacturing process that should be followed when you're trying to do some other critical welds that are not on pressure vessels. <coughs> 
you know, I get asked from time to time, a few times a year, by some company to write up a welding procedure for some critical application. And it may not be a pressure vessel, but I often use the Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code Section 9 for the qualification of welder and certification of welders. Because essentially, a, a, a welder who has been certified and qualified to the Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code is a is, has a certain minimum level of competency. It's not what I call a, a uh, farm tractor welder, okay? There's a large fraction of the welders in the country who actually learn to weld on the farm, repairing farm equipment, okay? They never had any real training, but some of them are very good and some of them are very bad, okay? There's no standardized minimum quality, but if someone's passed the requirements of ASME Section 9, then they have passed a standardized test and there's a certain min minimum level of competence. And that level of competence is actually fairly high. If someone tells me that they're an ASME um, code welder, then I know that they know something about welder, welding, okay? They actually can hold an electrode and do something of, of some value with it. If they tell me that they've been qualified to the structural welding code, there are two big codes for qualifying welders, and the steel welding code, the structural welding code for AWS, is the second one. This is for bridges and buildings. And most welders in the country are certified to one or the other if they have a certification. This one does not have as stringent requirements as ASME section, section 9. So if someone comes to me and they're building some, something new that's not a boiler, um, a boiler or a pressure vessel, a bridge or a building, and doesn't fall under any of these codes, doesn't mean that I, don't, I can't use part of that code and call it out as a useful standard. I don't have to write a new standard. And it doesn't have force of law because it's not under the scope of the code, but it's still a good manufacturing practice, right? So the better codes actually get used beyond their scope on a regular basis because they're just good practice, okay? Um, so that's what I mean by fair use. Um, and I've had people argue with me about fair use a number of times. Um, they say, well, it's not, it's not required by the code. Just because something's not required by the code doesn't mean that the code's not a good minimum level of, of standard. And you have to decide which codes you want to use. Now, since codes do overlap, and you can have conflicts. Some people are qualified, some welders are qualified to both the, uh, bo the boiler and pressure vessel code and the structural welding code, okay? Um, but it's, there's multiple structural welding codes. There's the one for steel, and there's the one for aluminum, okay? AWS D D11 and AWS D12, okay? Very clever terminology they have. Um, uh, and there's different qualification requirements because of different types of skills for welding aluminum versus steel. Um, when you run into conflicts, which governs? Well, if one of them is a, some codes are in the code of federal regulations. That means they're law. See, anybody know what the CFRs are, code of federal regu regulations? Okay. Multi, multi-volume set, and it goes into all kind of excruciating detail in certain areas. But it's because something happened once and someone got a congressman to write this into law, okay? And many times, the Code of Federal Regulations will call, call out one of these industrial codes, like the Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code. And so all of a sudden, the Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code inherits the force of law because it was written in the Code of Federal Reg Regulations. OSHA, when OSHA was formed 30, 40 years ago, they went through and they looked at all kinds of codes and they just wrote them into the, the law. OSHA actually is a law, it's part of the Code of Federal Regulations. And if you go through and read the OSHA documents in the code, CFR, you're gonna find references to all kinds of other codes. So they all, they all use each other, they all build on each other. There's a certain collaboration between them but since they weren't all written by the same person, in fact, they're all written by different committees, and so the codes have problems of conflicts, and that's what keeps me in business to a certain extent, is when there's a conflict in the code. 
And so we'll talk about some of that. What do you do when there's a conflict in the cloud? There's not a simple answer, okay? Um, if there was a simple answer, I wouldn't be able to, to work, right? Um, so we talked about the force of law and preemption. And by, by the way, you can do the problem set, I think I told you on the first day, if you preferred what I did last fall, and actually it was very, very successful. I said, if you don't want to do the problem, well actually I didn't give them the option. I only had five students then, uh, last fall. <coughs> um, I said, you're going to have to pick a single code, a simple code. I don't want the code of federal regulations, but you're going to have to do a 15 or 20 minute, or a 10, 10 or 15 minute pr presentation on a code and kind of what's the history of the code, this document. So it could be something like ASTM A106, which I handed out on pipe. Um, and you're gonna have to tell us this kind of um, outline of the history, the scope, what other codes it calls out, okay? These reference documents, codes and stuff, and make a presentation about it. Um, so there's not, at that point, there's not even a problem set. So why don't you, Kathleen, decide what they want to do, okay? I mean, get together with them. You don't have to decide for them, okay? But talk to them, consensus. Let's do a committee here. Uh, whether you want to do the problem set, which you can all do at once, or whether you want to do individual presentations. I actually learned quite a bit from the presentations, which is why I'm, why I'm willing to sit through them. But you all have to sit through them too. And we could do probably three a day. So, so it'd be about three days worth of work, okay, to come back in. Well, it's work, it's actually more work to put together the presentation and study the code, but one person was interested in bayonets. And there's, the Army has a code on, you know, if you're gonna sell a bayonet to go to the muzzle of a rifle to the Army, you have to meet this code, okay? And he, for whatever reason, he, he did the bayonet code. I didn't even know there was a bayonet code, but I now do know there's a bayonet code. Um, in any case, so, that's about all I want to say on scopes and limitations. The code will define its, its scope and the limitations, but there is fair use that goes beyond that. Conflicts, we've talked about. Interpretations. Um, even though committees have written this and they've done their best job, they don't always answer every question or some people don't know how to read, okay, the code. And so the code has different codes will come up with, and interpretations. You can write a letter and say some question like, um, does qualification as a welder under Part C, Section 5 qualify the welder as a welding operator under Part D, Section 5? This is an interesting question. I'm sure it's something you've struggled with all your life. And the answer, which comes back probably about six months later, because the committee has to meet, study the question, come to a consensus answer, and the answer is no. Okay. Now some of the answers, there's one here on ultrasonic testing where the question goes on for a page and a half and the answer goes on for a page. Okay. Um, but this is a list of all the questions and answers from 1976 to 1999 that were asked of the Structural Welding Code Committee. Okay. So there's, here's a historical record. And back in the late 90s when the Welding Society and a lot of other societies decided, oh, there's a gold mine here of selling these documents. All of this used to be in the records at the American Welding Society. They said, oh, we can dig out all our records, print it up, and sell it. Okay? So now you can buy the interpretations. It's another product that can be marketed. Um, but there are answers in there. And what will happen is many of those questions that come into the committee will require, some of them are difficult questions that there's not a simple answer to, and the committee will study it, and they may revise the code and improve the code. So codes get thicker with time, okay? They always get thick, well, they don't always get thicker with time. I actually brought you an example of a code that got smaller with time, okay? <coughs> this is the 1997 structural welding code for aluminum. It's this thick. This is the 2003 structural welding code for aluminum. If you look at them, they're not the same thickness, okay? 
The 2003 is thinner. Why? Uh, no, it wasn't thinner paper, okay? You know, 24 pound paper versus 16 pound paper. No, that's not the answer. Smaller type? No, it's not smaller type. Nope. Part, section, chapter two of these structural welding codes is on design. And what happened is in 2000, the, the Aluminum Association came out with the Aluminum Design Manual. And so chapter two is much shorter than it used to be because now they just call out this. So did it get smaller? No, it got a lot thicker. But the document itself, there, you know, that code now calls out this code, which didn't exist until 1994. The, the first version of this came out in 1994. Um, by 2000, they'd come up with an updated version, which was a little better. And so various, you know, they essentially wrote the design out of this one, well, they took it out of the full red one and put it into the red and white uh, and simplified the red and white. Another example of that I got here somewhere is how codes develop historically. Back in 1989, the U.S. Department of Commerce at NIST, where they have the Fire Protection Center, decided to write a fire investigation handbook. Okay, because they, they used to have a fire technology lab. They closed it down a year or two ago. But this is basically 1989 technology. Someone just typed it up into a word processor. A lot of things from a lot of scientists. And this was just sort of a, a guide that, they, that NIST came up with. Well, that evolved into something I've brought in a couple of times. The NFPA took that document, formed a committee, and now has this thickening code. I have the 2008 at home. I think I have the 99 code here. The 99 code is half as thick as this, which is twice as thick as the 89 fire investigation handbook. So historically, that's how this code came about, all in like 20, 25 years. Um, so that's kind of, there's different ways they come about. Um, so far as that goes, but there are interpretations. You can ask the code committees if they are standing committees, and they might meet twice a year typically, and they will bring it on, put it on their agenda, and answer a question, give you a long, complicated answer like yes or no. Um, are the interpretations that considered codes themselves? No, not until the code is revised. They it may get revised and go into the code, uh, but they're not the interpretations wouldn't necessarily hold the force of law. Some judge might be able to decide whether they could be admitted as an interpretation, but I mean, that's beyond me, okay? So you're really just responsible for the standards, and if you seek extra knowledge for the interpretations, great, but you're not responsible for knowing what the interpretations Correct. In fact, if to expand on that, <coughs> this code, structural welding code, Actually, well, let's see if I can find the last part of it. Yeah. A little, 60% of it is the code. 40% of it is annexes and commentaries, which are annexes to the code, whatever that means, or a commentary on the code written by the people who wrote the code. But it's, if you read the commentary, it's kind of, this is what we mean, because the codes are written sort of tersely, okay, you know, on purpose. They're written in sort of a legalese. And so people found that rather than having to respond to a bunch of interpretations, they've actually started including commentaries in the code. So this isn't the only code. The boiler and pressure vessel code, I think, has commentaries and things. So the codes are getting more and more complex. But the code itself is just the code without its commentaries or its interpretations. OK? Um, now, collaborations and competition in codes. Well, there's certainly a lot of um, collaboration. I told you about how NASA, DOD, and the FAA got together to come up with the Aerospace Materials, or the Materials Handbook, 
which, you know, is on the shelf, it's this thick in 13 volumes. This just has to be chapter three on aluminum alloys. Um, and it's lots of data on the fatigue strength, the creep strength, um, the uh, tensile strength of a whole range of aluminum alloys. Okay? And that's a lot of that comes from the aluminum companies Alcan, Alcoa, Kaiser, Boeing is not an aluminum company, but the, you know, that data, if a company wants to submit that data for evaluation, then they can include it in the code. And the FAA says if you're going to build an aircraft, this is the minimum standard for the material properties. If you want to use something else, you're going to have to justify it. But if you use this, we'll accept it and we won't make you jump through a bunch of hoops because we find this is the standard properties that you can expect for this aluminum alloy, okay, under these conditions. So that's collaboration and there's lots of collaborations. In fact, collaboration in codes got to be a big deal um, in the early 90s after the first Gulf War. Um, a couple of things came out of the first Gulf War. One was rapid prototyping became a big deal. Anybody remember, or do you still use a lot of rapid pro prototyping? What they found in the Gulf War, the war didn't last long enough to do a lot of research for the war. <laughs> what did it last, a week, two weeks or something? Uh, but there were things that were needed. Once they started flying helicopters over in all the dust in Saudi Arabia or whatever, they found that all of a sudden the, the sand was sandblasting the engines and they weren't lastings but, but a few hours rather than hundreds of hours. So there were, there were a couple of major failures in that first Gulf War and a couple of major successes where, because remember they, they took, didn't they take, wasn't that the war, they took about a year or six months to, to move everything over there and, and to prepare for the invasion. I mean this was the invasion that was coming but they had plenty of time to do all the logistics to get everything over to Saudi Arabia before they actually did the advance. Uh, but the advance didn't take very long, but they learned things even before that. And so in about a six month period, they had to identify a problem and solve a problem. There were some problems that they never quite solved that cost them a lot of money. There were other problems that they did solve that saved them a lot of money. And so one of the things that came out of that was ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, started a whole major program on rapid prototyping. How you could conceive, design, and develop something and get it to market in a very short period of time. And one of the great failures of those types of programs was NASA tried to develop the X-33 space plane on a 30-month schedule, okay, from design through fabrication to test flight and the whole 1.3 billion dollar program was a flop because you can't well we didn't have the ability to do it in 30 months they gave it to the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and they tried to do it but uh, they ran into some problems you don't have a lot of time if everything goes well you might be able to do it but not everything goes well in research okay sometimes things don't work in any case um, rapid prototyping became a big buzzword in the early 90s uh, because, in part because of the Gulf War, but the other thing that became a buzzword was dual-use technology. The Democrats came in and peace was breaking out with the former Soviet Union, the defense budgets were going down, and the way they'd, the Democrats decided they were going to balance the uh, uh, budget or meet the needs is one of the secretaries of defense or something said, we're going to leverage our knowledge of um, of industrial uses and standards and combine it with military needs. Now that would be fine. Well actually, let me back up. There was a predecessor to that that actually I ended up getting involved in um, in the mid 80s during Star Wars and the Republicans and Ronald Reagan said we're going to be able to build this missile defense system which was called Star Wars we we'll have these 50 megawatt lasers in, up in the space and we'll shoot down any missile in the boost stage that's coming out of some other country and uh, we'll protect the United States that way. And that's basically how Reagan won the Cold War. He bankrupted the Soviet Union. They could not keep up with, and Reagan also introduced the idea of deficit spending, 
which, you know, the Republicans never believed in deficits until Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan taught the Republicans that you can buy votes with deficits. Okay? And so now we have a competition between the Democrats and the Republicans of who can buy the most votes with a deficit. Okay? This is, this is the finances of the United States. Um, but in any case, um, the Republicans bankrupted the former Soviet Union by doing this Star Wars buildup. Um, the Democrats, when they came in in 92, when, that, when Clinton came in, decided they were going to do dual-use technology. And they decided that they didn't need all the military standards. They were going to get rid of all the military standards and they were going to combine them into um, uh, civilian standards. This is just one part of dual use. Dual use is you build a Jeep, you know, a Jeep Wrangler. What's the difference between a Jeep Wrangler and a, and a, and a regular Jeep the Army uses? Well, it turns out there's a pretty big difference. And nowadays, with uh, the, the MRAP vehicles that weigh 60 tons, you know, there's a big difference between a Jeep Wrangler and a, and a 60 ton MRAP. Uh, so there has been a, a divergence in military needs and civilian needs, but nonetheless, in 19, 20 years ago, the Democrats were going to balance the military budget by doing dual use. And they essentially got rid of an awful lot of the military standards. I mean, there used to be a lot of military standards, but the standard for statistical quality inspection and manufacturing, which was a mill standard, I've got a copy of the mill standard in my office, but it be became ASME B18.18. Almost word for word. They just sort of, ASME said, thank you, military, we'll adopt this, we'll bless it, um, and we will maintain it. So the military didn't have to maintain it. So it did save some things. But, you know, I don't know if there's that many civilian uses of bayonets, okay? So it, doesn't, it wasn't a perfect mapping, okay, um, between military standards. There probably still are some military standards in some areas, I assume. I, don't, I haven't been designing with the military in the last few years, but anyway, I'm sure they probably still have some. So there's collaborations where people try to combine things, and there's the aluminum design manual and the aluminum structural welding code is one example. Uh, the dual use type stuff where, um, but there's also competition. There's the American National Standards Institute, which I talked about before, which basically doesn't write any standards, but they will they will adopt your standard and help market it around the world and convince people that you should be using this standard to build your pipeline in Uruguay. Okay, you should use an American Petroleum Institute standard, which is ANSI standard X, written by the American Petroleum Institute, but it's a certified American national standard, which means there was a collaboration between American Petroleum Institute and ANSI that ANSI would take this over and, and try to promote it promulgate the standard. In the meantime, in the early 90s, the um, European Commission, uh, com Economic Community, the Commission, started saying, those wretched Americans, they're using their strength and standards to control the world's commerce. I mean, everybody in the world, except the Chinese and a few others, builds pressure vessels to the boiler pressure vessel code. The Chinese just do it on their own because they're not going to pay $12,000 a year for the boiler and pressure vessel code. They'll just do it on their own, and they can. I mean, they, they're a sovereign nation. So they don't build pressure vessels to the ASME code unless they've got to sell them in the United States, in which case they have to buy that code anyway. But I'm sure they copy that code, okay? <coughs> and don't, they buy one copy for the country or whatever. Um, <coughs> uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, to a certain extent. Well, they're, they're all the trade <laughs> around <laughs> that has to pass through the Western Hemisphere, you know, from the Pacific to the Atlantic, yes. But that's not an American standard. That's not an American standard. The, I didn't say the American, but by and large, every pipeline built in the world in general is built by an oil company that will call out the American Petroleum Institute standards. Most utilities, uh, chemical companies, which are those same oil companies, is going to build a chemical refinery. They're going to build it to the ASME code. That's what they know. That's what, they're, that's what their designers are going to call out. Okay? Thanks. I know it's getting darker. I thought the sun <laughs> cloud coming. Anyway, um, it's getting darker. You know, it's getting darker. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, 
American companies controlled a lot of commerce and would call out things. Other manufacturers around the world would have to use American standards because they wouldn't sell, wanted to sell in the United States. And therefore, a lot of those countries would end up adopting the American standards within their own country. Well, the Europeans saw this as a competitive advantage and they formed the International Standards Organization in Switzerland, which is not part of the EEC, but nonetheless, that's where it's headquartered. Um, but the Germans have the DIN standards, and I don't know what DIN stands for, but it's Deutsche something. I mean, you know, German in Germany in, in German begins with a D. Okay, so these DIN standards, just like we have ANSI standards, they have DIN standards. And the Germans, the DIN standards were used all throughout Europe, but they didn't really spread to Japan and, and the United, United States as well as the Americans were exporting our standards. Okay. So that's why you, you can now get a BMW built in American spec with European spec. Can you? Yes. Oh. So when I was in Germany, I, I bought a car over there and, and from a German. You had to have it redone for America. You couldn't bring it back. Right. Well, when I, when I lived in Tokyo, you couldn't buy a Toyota in Tokyo and then bring it back without spending thousands of dollars to bring it up to U.S. standards. Yes, you're right. Okay, I mean, there's a lot of this stuff in the standards that's done for the export market. And since the United States was a third of the world's market, and now it's only a quarter, but nonetheless, we controlled enough of the market that everybody wanted to build it to our specs. Okay. Uh, to give you a, a, another example, when our gasoline was priced at buck seventy-five or two dollars a gallon twenty years ago, you could never justify building a car out of aluminum at that price. Steel, I mean, the value of a pound saved in an automobile is two dollars a pound over the life of the vehicle, um, and so at the price of gasoline of anything less than four or five dollars a gallon you had to build it out of steel it just you couldn't recoup your investment by the weight savings of using aluminum well at that time you know the Norwegians are charging six dollars a gallon for the gasoline and most of the rest of the world was charging four if people were building cars for their own market they would have made them out of aluminum twenty years ago now, the Germans actually did build the Audi, which is all aluminum, but that's a $100,000 vehicle, and any fool can build a $100,000 vehicle out of aluminum, but it takes a little know-how to build a $20,000 vehicle out of aluminum. So we built Duesenbergs in the 1930s that were all aluminum, okay? I think, uh, who was it, Mellon, of Mellon Bank. Mellon Bank's out of Pittsburgh, and they just happened to fund a little company called Alcoa, Okay, that's where they got to be a big bank. Okay, they funded Charles Martin Hall, who started Alcoa. Um, in any case, Andrew Mellon, I, I have a book on aluminum that shows pic picture with uh, Andrew Mellon with his all aluminum Pierce Arrow automobile, specially built for him out of aluminum rather than steel. Steel's the cheapest for the initial cost, but it's more expensive when you think of the, the the maintenance cost, or not maintenance cost, but the operating cost of all the fuel, the extra weight and everything. So why was everybody building a steel car in the 19... I used to give talks about this. I said the reason they were doing it is because they wanted to ship their Toyotas or the BMWs to the United States. Because otherwise they would be too expensive. Americans wouldn't buy them. So they were paying a penalty in their own country on gasoline in order to meet the American market. Okay, that's a little oversimplified, but it's the same type of thing. Uh, the world, we control the market, okay? And, and people do things to be able to get into our market. At least they used to. They're not doing it quite as much because world trade has increased and, and stuff. Anyway, so away from the economics lesson because I'm not an economics professor. Anyway, that doesn't mean I won't expound on it though, okay? Um, so. Competition, ISO really came about uh, to a certain extent to compete with this American, it wasn't a stranglehold, but it was certainly a dominant position in standards. And it wasn't something that we set out, I don't think strategically we set out to do, but just because of our market size, we just were the 800 pound gorilla on the block in terms of standards, okay? Um, competition.
ISO, one of the first things they came up with was ISO 9000. It was a big hit. What's ISO 9000? Anybody know? In the early 90s, Ford Motor Ca Company came up with, in their world suppliers, if you were not ISO 9000 certified, we will, Ford will not purchase from you. Period. No exceptions to their first tier suppliers. Second tier, they wanted you to be ISO 9000, but they couldn't control it because they really were just controlling the, the first tier suppliers. I think it's, it's broader than just materials. I think it's sort of processes and... It's procedures is what it is. Documenting your procedures. It's not even materials, so far as that goes. It's not like ASTM. You had to have documented procedures, okay? If you were going to fill out a purchase order, you had to have it documented so that if the person who was your purchase order guru died tomorrow, someone else could go and look at the document and see how to fill out a purchase order. So you wouldn't lose all that. It's sort of a way to maintain your corporate knowledge. And everything you did, you know, going to get a drink of water was supposed to be documented, okay? Yeah, not, maybe that's a little exaggeration. But almost everything you did had to be documented and they had a standard. ISO 9000, which is not a small standard, that taught you how to document procedures. Now, in fact, that was enough of success and it was also coming at the time of what was called total quality man management, which was coming out of Japan, which was this guy Deming from the United States who had taught the Japanese. The Japanese were these great you know, world beater manufacturers in the early 90s in terms of quality of Toyotas and stuff. And they had the Toyota production system was a bunch of procedures, okay? It's not, you know, use this material, but it's how do you go about doing X, Y, and Z? How do you go about your daily task, okay? That's ISO 9000. Ford came in and said, we won't buy from anybody that's not ISO 9000. So all of a sudden American companies were in a scramble to become ISO 9000 qualified. Otherwise, you couldn't sell to some, and other suppliers, not just Ford. I think Boeing adopted it, and a number of companies. Over the years, a lot of companies have adopted ISO 9000 as the standard by which you have to prove that you have a quality management program in process, okay, that documents all your procedures. It's really a, a management standard of how do you manage your business. Actually, I don't know all that much about ISO 9000, but if you're interested, I have a book on it. Um, which I haven't read, okay? But in any case, that was competition in one area between ISO and uh, ANSI, and ISO won that competition, but they still compete on other standards, okay? And there is a competition out there on standards because standards does affect your ability to market things. If someone goes out for a, a, uh, uh, a proposal, um, or a, a procurement, a request for a proposal, they will list certain standards. I mean, there's a whole section there in that RFP about what standards you have to follow, and if they list U.S. standards as opposed to Europe, European standards, that gives American companies an advantage, assuming the American companies know the American standards. Okay, and so the European companies had to be bilingual or trilingual in terms of standards in order to compete on a global basis. So there are some people who are trying to improve collaboration and make standards international standards, and there are some people who are trying to hold it into themselves for a competitive advantage, okay? There's that dynamic going on. Costs, we talked about this yesterday. Purchase orders, I wanna talk about purchase orders. Um, if you went to, uh, I'm gonna ask you a philosophical question. You go to um, uh, General Motors or Ford or Toyota and you buy a new car that's basically stripped down, doesn't have any extra, you know, might have an air conditioner, but it doesn't have a, it doesn't have the six CD changer or, actually they don't even have that anymore. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, sorry? High high connection. High, okay, in any case. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles, okay? And you buy it and you come back a year later and say, well, this doesn't have these other options. Do you think they're going to then install those other options at their expense? Mm 
Well, you didn't order those options, right? So most people would say you don't have a right to it if you give them that example. But I fortunately get involved in controversy several times a year. Let's put another child through school. Um, where someone says, we ordered these welded components and we ordered it to this standard and we've now for whatever reason we we had some problem or someone went in and did something and we found that there's defects in our welds surprise surprise okay i mean the the uh, i'm not going to talk about a lot on safety factors but if you went through the structural welding code dr Dr. Belmar is going to talk next Wednesday on safety factors. But if you went through the structural welding code, oh, I wish I had chalk. Um, you know, if I left the chalk here, it wouldn't, anyway, it wouldn't be here the next day. So for a bridge, for a building, the structural welding code says the safety factor should be 1.67, five thirds is the number. For a bridge, which is dynamically loaded, fatigue should be 2.0 and for a weld it should be 3.3. Okay, so if you're going to calculate the stress and this code in chapter 2 tells you how to cal calculate the stress on a weld, it doesn't tell you how to calculate the stress on the the plate or the I-beam, but the American Institute of Steel construction will tell you how to do that, uh, their codes. But for the welding code, you got to have essentially double the safety factor. Why? Because we know welds are going to be defects. Some people define a weld as a continuous defect surrounded by good material. Okay? Um, so, I mean, just by the very nature of putting down a weld, you can end up with lots of, lots of different types of flaws. And so what they do is they just put a bigger safety factor on it to allow for it. I could have a weld that's 50% flaws in a statically loaded structure it will probably perform just as well as the base plate. Okay? Because I've got double the safety factor. So I sort of assume that I could have a really lousy welder. Okay? Or a really good welder who had a bad day. I mean, whatever reason, you put a bigger safety factor on it. That's all I want to say about safety factors right now, but Dr. Belmar will talk about more about it later. Well, then someone comes in and they do some sort of test and it says, oh, we found a flaw in our weld. Well, duh. I mean, you know, I, uh, I actually wrote a paper once for a conference as the keynote speaker it said, in search of the perfect weld, okay? Then what is a perfect weld? I mean, you can't even define a weld very well, much less a perfect weld. But in the welding code, this is the structural welding code, okay, they've dealt with this a million times, okay? So this is under contractor responsibilities. It says non-specified NDT other than visual. What's NDT? Non-destructive testing, okay. So non-destructive testing other than visual. If you look at the visual inspection requirements, it's right here in 6.9 all welds shall be visually inspected and shall be acceptable blah 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 okay pretty simple you got to inspect every one of them the guy who makes the weld has to have his sight he, you cannot have blind welders okay they have to look at the weld and they have to determine whether it looks okay per these criteria in table six okay which means if it doesn't look like a dog just did his business there you can probably accept it Okay, the, the visual inspection requirements are not that rigorous, but there are requirements that someone look at it. Okay, but if you had anything else, which could be what? Magnetic particle, ultrasonic, radiographic, eddy current, there's a whole host of different specified techniques. If NDT other than visual, because all welds have to be visually inspected, is not specified in the original contract document, but is subsequently requested by the owner. So this is like going in and saying, you know, I didn't get this feature on my Toyota, but I've decided I want it. 
even though I didn't pay for it, they, they have to spell out in the code, the contractor shall perform any requested testing or shall allow any testing to be performed in conformance with 6.14. The owner shall be responsible for all associated, the owner, including handling, surface preparation, NDT, and repair of discontinuities other than those described, blah, blah, blah. Unless there's fraud involved, okay? So, you know, there, unless you can show that the contractor was trying to defraud or gross nonconformance to this code, whatever that means, the owner has to pay for this extra work. If they didn't ask for it in the purchase order, if they didn't pay for it, and they want a higher level of inspection, you got to pay for it, folks. That's what this says. It's just like buying that Toyota that didn't have the features and you decide you want the features. Okay, the, contra you know, the, the contractor's got to give it to you, but who has to pay for it, okay? Now, how many of you have worked in a soup ship? None of you. None of you? Shipyard. Okay. I was the customer. All of you, what? Yeah, but I worked at Spayward. So she's the only one that's been on a video Okay, wow. That's unusual. Usually half the students here are in one of these classes has, have worked in a soup, soup ship. And let me tell you, it's not the most exciting job in the world. You mostly spend your day either drinking coffee or arguing with the, uh, the people in the shipyard over, is this weld big enough? Okay, or is this defect within the allowable specification, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, but some of you will probably go to a soup ship, right? <laughs> okay, um, so in any case, this comes up all the time because for some reason someone sees something and they find a defect and they say, oh, I have a defect. Well, of course, but if that defect's not huge, a factor of two of the size of the weld, it probably is allowed for in the safety factor, okay? And so then people get in fights all the time over whether they get or should get what they paid for. Okay? If it's not specified in the contract documents, you don't get it. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. But people will argue this over and over because they don't understand things like these safety factors and how the code has developed over the years a number of different approaches to uh, dealing with uh, the problems of manufacturing doesn't produce a perfect product every time. And when I've been to places like Bath Iron Works or Newport News or Electric Boat, um, these fights occur all the time and there's not a great relationship between soup ship and the yard in most cases, okay? I remember I was evaluating a program for the Maritime Administration on an automatic inspector of the inspection of the size of fillet welds. And the fillet weld, let's say, was supposed to be a quarter inch fillet weld. And so they developed this little laser-based inspector that could go along, you could scan it along, and it would automatically do an inspection. It could detect the size of a fillet weld. I mean, people know what a fillet weld is? I'm assuming that, okay. A fillet weld is if you got a a plate like this, it intersects a plate like this, and you put a weld in the corner like that, it's a fillet weld, okay? Lots of these on ships, okay? And the size of that fillet weld, fillet weld is defined in the United States as the leg length here, okay? Now, the problem is there's two leg lengths, and so how do you define the size of the fillet weld when you have two measurements? If one of them's under and one of them's over, you know, what is the, see, there are standards to help you define that. Because the question has come up before. In Europe, they actually use a more scientific definition, which is the throat thickness, which is this dimension. But nonetheless, we measured as the leg length. The two should be related if it was a perfect triangle, which it's not. Um, and the throat thickness, if you have a lot of reinforcement, you could argue you have a bigger throat. Anyway, you start thinking very hard about this. You have to say, well, what is I really want to measure? Well, what you really want is some surrogate for the strength of this thing. But in any case, so they had this little laser-based measure that could come in and just scan it down the, you know, take your hand and roll the thing along the side of the fillet weld, and it would pop out a number of 
the average size, the variation, you know, all the thing did all the statistics, okay? So now you have more numbers than you ever wanted, okay? I can remember early in my career working on some quality control things and going down to electric boat and saying, hey, you know, we can measure such and such and, and uh, about welding. And the guy said, the last thing I want is another thing I can measure because I'm going to be held to that standard, <laughs> okay? So there's, there's an upside and downside to measuring things. In any case, this little laser-based laser measurer could measure things within plus or minus about 10 thousandths of an inch. So they got some real people, some inspectors, at the shipyard to go out there and show them the same welds and ask them with their little hand gauges or with their eyes or whatever what the size of the weld was because they now had something, an automated, arbitrary, you know, uh, uh, non-judgmental machine that would give them a number and statistics and everything very easily. And they found that the inspectors, even with their measurement tools, couldn't do any better than about 020. So here was a machine that could had twice the accuracy of the welders, of the inspectors, but Soup Ship was arguing over the size of the fillet weld because they came in with this thing and it was 10 thousandths under. Even though before when that spec was written, no one could have even measured 10 thousandths because it's not perfectly you know, straight along there and stuff. No one could have even measured that. So we're now, as we improve our measurement techniques, we get into more fights, okay? You know, when I was a, an undergraduate student working in the lab around here, we were doing superconductivity. We only owned one germanium thermometer. They cost $500, which was a lot of money back then. Um, and we had one and we decided, well, if that one breaks, we're gonna be out of business. We need to buy another one. We spent six months trying to figure out which one was correct. Because you put them both down in liquid helium and start heating things up, and they're off by a couple of tenths of a degree. So which one's right? We know what the temperature was when we only had one measurement. <laughs> we had two measurements now and we didn't have a clue. Okay? And we were trying to measure, you know, I was trying to measure 18.1 degrees versus 18.2 degrees for which one's the better superconductor. Okay? We were trying to break the world's record at that time with 20.3 or something. Anyway. Um, so when we talk, of the reason, one of the reasons for going through observables is you can talk about accuracy and precision and stuff, but you actually ultimately have to bring it back to reality, okay? And to give you a reality check, a lot of the, the boiling pressure vessel code and the structural welding code were built up by 80 to 100 years of experience and committees of people working together in good faith and there are certain things like in the welding code, they're never looking for a flaw smother, smaller than an eighth of an inch. Why? Well, the Air Force did a big study and you can't find flaws with more than 50% accuracy at a sixteenth of an inch. You got a pretty good, you got like a 95% probability of finding a flaw at an eighth of an inch. So the code, this is before the Air Force did this study 20 years ago, the code had already decided don't look for flaws smaller than an eighth of an inch because they're not going to be harmful. They didn't actually say it that way, but no one had ever had a problem with a vessel that might have had some of the flaws that size. Okay? And it turns out if you go through fracture mechanics, flaws that are less than an eighth of an inch in size with steel with the typical toughness of a structural steel, it doesn't mean a hill of beans. And you got a 3.3 safety factor on top of it. Okay, the fundamental equation of fracture mechanics, which you'll get in some of the other lectures, is the fracture toughness of the material must be greater than the stress times the square root of pi times the crack length. Okay? This is a material property. It only gets so bad for steels. Okay? Steels actually have a fair amount of toughness in spite of their... This is the flaw size you're looking for, an eighth of an inch. Okay, pi, I know that. I know it with a lot of precision, actually. Okay, um, and sigma, that's the stress. If you're a civil engineer, they don't know Greek, so they use S, okay? 
Um, but so sigma is the stress, but the code gave you a design stress for the base material. And so you know what your limits are on stress if you designed it properly. You plug in the lower than maximum yield stress. You plug in an eighth of an inch and you can compare it to the toughness of the steel and you find eighth of an inch is fine, no problems. Okay? So what happened to the Sea Wolf submarine? The Sea Wolf submarine, they were looking for eighth inch flaws. That's what the codes say. That's what reality says is all you can find with any probability. But what happened is some grinder was grinding the weld smooth. You know, on a, on a submarine, you can't have these big humps like the, a, a weld when you're going through the water. It's amazing how quiet these things have to be. Okay, but they have to grind the weld flat. And this guy's grinding the weld and he notices that the swarf, the little particles from grinding, which is called swarf, it's a good, good Scrabble word, S-W-A-R-F. Um, okay, the swarf is lining up in little lines about less than a sixteenth of an inch in length. He says, I've never seen that before. So he goes and tells someone, and someone says, hmm, I've never seen that before. And so they start investigating it, and the welds had a whole family, a cluster, they were full of these little micro cracks. Once they got them and started looking at them by cutting out the weld and doing destructive testing, things that you would never do regu regularly. And so what happened is they realized the whole ship, they sampled around, they had completed 18% of the hull, and they found the whole ship was full of these things. And they tracked it down and I believe, I had to write a report on it, that it was the weld wire was on the high side chemistry. Well, we knew it was on the high side chemistry and I thought there were some other things that, anyway, it's in one of my, it's one of those lectures you're gonna see on video. I'll tell you, you'll get a longer version of the story. But nonetheless, some guy happened to notice, a grinder happened to notice something out of the ordinary. They were looking for flaws that were smaller than anything the specification had ever asked for before, okay? Uh, and this was the first generation of that su class of submarine. No one was going to take a chance. It was a $2 billion vessel anyway. And it cost, I've heard, I used to hear numbers of half a billion dollars it cost the Navy to fix that. More recently, I've heard that the ultimate cost was about $2 billion to fix the problem. You could have built a new sub for that, right? They they, well, no, they, they built two Sea Wolves. Yeah, and then they canceled. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> But the reason for that, it was built to defeat the Soviet Union. And there is no longer a Soviet Union, okay? If you start firing those boomers off, then it's all over anyway, folks. I'm sorry, okay? Um, you have to be willing to do it, but you don't ever want to do it. So this is that, that's another conflict, okay? Pardon me? Yeah, but you're, you know, you ever see the movie Seven Days in May? Okay, okay. There's only a few. <laughs> Actually, I think Georgia having been bombed by a nuclear weapon is just slightly worse than Georgia in the first place. <laughs> Georgia having been bombed by a nuclear weapon? Well, are we talking Georgia in, Euro in uh, Asia or are we talking about Georgia in the, Georgia as Atlanta? In the southern United States. They were bombed by a nuclear bomb? So when, you're, when you leave <laughs> I grew up in Atlanta, on part a submarine time. and you come back to Georgia on a submarine and you never get port calls and you're wondering about what if you did launch? What, I mean, I always picture, so if we launch, you know, you'd have to think about all those people that died, and then <laughs> if there is a nuclear war, Georgia and Bangor are going to get bombed. It's just gonna yeah, oh yeah, 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 okay, arsenal. fine. So, you so where you go back to, yeah, is and, what you're saying. Well, there's Jacksonville. <laughs> so everybody that's stationed in Georgia, like their entire families would be wiped out. So you just go beach in the Bahamas somewhere and start drinking that coconut. Okay, well, at least you've thought about it. You've got a plan. <laughs> I mean, have, you, have you written up the procedure for that? <laughs> Is your ISO up to date? Anyway, okay, so let's, let's talk about another example, unless there are other questions. This was, this was interesting to know that you guys have thought about uh, what to do in case of a nuclear holocaust. Um, um, Okay, so let's, this actually is the reason I decided to teach this class last fall. Um, 
I was involved, or I am still involved, in a situation where someone bought some A106 pipe, which is also B31 something, and whether you're buying ASME or ASTM, there's like five different standards that, co that cover this pipe. But in fact, they were using ASTM A106, which is the standard specification for seamless carbon steel pipe for high temperature service. I handed this out because we're going to spend a little time talking about it. And we talked about scope, and we talked about reference documents, and what I made the students do last fall is take any standard, and there's going to be a bunch of reference documents, and they each, each actually spread this out to ANSI standards, military standards, federal standards, other standards, <sighs> okay. Any standard you call out probably lists another 15 or 20 standards, okay. So this is the burden I talked about yesterday. If you're going to go into the business, you've got to know all these standards and how each one references everything. And every one of those you go to will reference another standard. So this is growing, as we call it, exponentially in terms of standards that you have to understand and know. It actually does start to converge at a few thousand standards, okay? But uh, it's a burden if you wanted to enter a business that you didn't already understand, okay? Now, just to read this standard, um, this is, I happen to have dash 97, I'm sure there's a newer one. 97 is 1997. That's the way you read ASTM numbers. This is also, we mentioned, was an American National Standard. ANSI p adopted this. Down at the bottom, ASTM will always tell you, originally published as A106-26. This standard started in 1926, okay? Um, if we go through the standard, it'll talk about it'll tell you how the steel must be made. Okay, well actually before I do that, this is, it says right the, the title, specification, it's a standard specification, for seamless carbon steel pipe for high temperature service. High temperature service, I'm not even sure if it's defined, I'm sure there's some standard that defines it I guess, but I don't know what it is. But it's a few hundred degrees, probably above the boiling point of water or something. Um, in fact, I bet that's probably what it is. But anyway, there are other standards. This is A53, which the way I remember these is 53 is half of 106. Okay, anyway. They don't always work that way, but in this case it does. This is a standard specification for pipe, steel, black, and hot dip, zinc coated, welded, and seamless. So this specification covers seamless and welded, black and hot dip, blah, 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 blah. So what's the difference between these standards? Oops. This is seamless carbon steel. This is seamless and welded. This does not say high temperature. This one will say high temperature if you look at the title. Okay? So this is for seamless high temperature. This is for seamless black iron pipe. Well, what's black iron pipe? I can go to the hardware store and buy a piece of welded black iron pipe. So this is A53. It's not A106. If someone wanted to make the plumbing for my basement, out of non-welded steel, out of seamless steel, not only would it cost me a lot more, but I could operate it at higher temperatures and blah blah blah. Um, but it uh, it would be it would confer it would be equivalent to an A106 as well as an A53. So it could come under two specifications. So you better hope that they don't have conflicts among A53 and A106, at least on certain levels. Well, it turns out they won't because it's the same committee that is responsible for both of these specs. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about the fact. Oh, the other thing is this one does not reference A53, and A53 doesn't reference A106 because, so far as the committee is concerned, they're two different pipes. Although the same pipe, if this was a piece of seamless pipe, it would come under both. Well, how would you know that? Well, if you're a member of the committee, you'd know that or you've been working in the business for 20 years, you might know that. But if you're just someone going to read the book for the first time, you haven't got a clue. And there's nothing even tell you where to go to look for the other standards that might fall under. So this is one of the problems of how standards are written. Um, you, they don't give you, you, ha, you, there's not a designer's guide to reading standards. Well, I guess because no one would read it. <laughs> It would be the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> anyway, the process. The steel shall be killed steel. Well, that means it has to be deoxidized. You don't have to worry about that. 
although if you took the casting part of my course, we'll talk about that. With the primary melting process being open hearth, which no one in the world uses anymore, we gave it up about 1985, basic oxygen, which everybody uses, or electric furnace, which everybody uses. Possibly with separate degassing or refining. In any case, so you can make it by any way you want, basically. That's what it says to me as a metallurgist. But nonetheless, that's what's allowed. If someone comes along with something else, it's gotta be, they gotta requalify it. There's a heat analysis and a product analysis. Does anyone know what the difference is? This is chemical analysis. This all comes under chemical composition down at the bottom. So section eight and nine, after chemical composition, talk about the chemical analysis in terms of a heat analysis and a product analysis. This causes confusions to people in materials all the time because they don't know the difference. When you, huh? Did someone about to guess? It's okay to guess. I don't slap you down that bad when you, when you get it wrong. Anyway, um, a heat analysis, when you make the steel, you might have 150 tons or 300 tons in the vessel, and you dip in before you cast the steel. You take a little sample on a long rod. You cool it. You send it off to the, sh to the shop. Within less than five minutes, you will have an analysis pack. And that little bulb of metal represents 300 tons or 150 tons of steel. That's the heat analysis. The heat is the big molten bath. That's the heat analysis and that's what that heat is certified to and sold to the composition of that little sample out of 300 tons. And generally it's actually pretty good. But in fact, if you get it down to something like this, well I don't know where all the brothers and sisters of this 300 tons went. And if I, this is all I've got left, and I do a sample on this product, this is the product, that chemical analysis will, might be a little different than the one that was the average of all 300 tons because there is some segregation. It's not perfectly homogeneous in the steel, right? So there is another specification written by ASTM that tells you how closely the product analysis should equal the heat analysis, okay? So there's a specification for the specification. But people will often do a product analysis and say, oh, this doesn't match the heat analysis. It must not be the same steel. Well, within certain limits, there is a specification that would say, yes, it is the same steel. It's just a, a little one pound piece out of 300 tons may not be exactly the same composition. There are really exciting pages in here that tables that you will want to read on tonight for hours, okay? But how was the steel bought? So this was going into a big petroleum chemical refining plant and someone bought 600 lengths of steel. Now most of it was 6 to 20 inches in diameter. This was not small pipe. Uh, they bought it at a time uh, back in eight or ten years ago when there was a big shortage of steel pipe in the world. And if you're trying to build a plant at that particular point in time, you just had to find a source of steel. So they went and they bought it and this stuff came from Romania. Okay, best Romanian steel. Okay, best quality Romanian steel. That's not necessarily the greatest recommendation in the world. But nonetheless, the steel by ASTM 106, each length of pipe shall withstand without leakage through the pipe wall a hydrostatic test. Okay? You have to pump it up with water and pressurize it. In this case, there's different hydrostatic pressures which will be um, listed and actually listed on the purchase order. If you want it p tested to 1500 PSI or 2500 PSI, you have to tell the steel company what pressure you want it tested to. Well, usually in one of these pipes, 15, in a lot of these were tested about 1500 PSI for the smaller diameters. Uh, but that's like 40% of yield strength for these pipes. I mean, they would have been able to take four or 5,000 PSI, okay? But they only had to be hydro tested to 1500. Well, how big can the flaws be? It's seamless. But how big can the flaws be in that piece of pipe in order to support 1500 PSI but have imperfections? Well, they can be pretty big. I mean, not in this case, but I had a case down in the Gulf of Mexico 
where someone had a hydro test of a pipe made in the United States in a seamless mill and they were going to put it in as an underwater pipeline in the Gulf to take the oil from the from the drilling rig in the Gulf onshore to the uh, refinery and it was only a four inch pipe but it had been hydro tested at the mill it had been uh, magnetically particle inspected and eddy current inspected at the mill uh, passed all those tests sent it down to Louisiana sandblasted it off all the information of identifying who the steel was okay who the steel maker was coated it with this re uh, yellow coating um, for cr corrosion resistance because you're going to bury it in the ocean and they welded it laid it down at the bottom of the ocean and then they had to do one last hydro test on the final assembly and it leaked it already been hydro tested and passed twice and the hydro test at the bottom of the ocean was actually a lower pressure than the ones that had passed already and there was a leak eh, it cost them four million dollars to get it out of the ocean bring it back and the delay in the project and everything else and not everyone was happy okay so we went to look at it and what it was is this was about a half inch thick pipe it's only about four inch pretty high strength pipe about a half inch wall maybe maybe centimeter wall but anyway uh, in about a four to six inch pipe as I remember but it had a one of the tools that they used to to make the seamless pipe they basically just take a a hardened steel piece and they just ram it through this hot piece of 2200 degree Fahrenheit steel and just just like sticking your finger through a piece of clay you make a pipe okay only they're doing it with a piece of steel a piece of that tool broke off and wedged itself into the wall of the pipe and it was probably three or four inches long and it was 80 percent of the wall thickness of the pipe and it had stayed in there it was sort of wedged in and so it passed the first hydro test because it had a plug in it a v-shaped plug and it passed the hydro test at the mill it passed the inspection test because it was in sort of a critical area that was not very well inspected I don't want to get into all of that but it passed the inspections because it was located in just the wrong spot okay it passed the hydro test it passed another hydro test it got down there at the bottom of the ocean and I don't know if the plug came loose because of the previous hydro test starting to give me a little plastic deformation open it up so the wedge could fall out when the wedge is no longer there it wouldn't pass the hydro it leaked couldn't put it into service had to take it out it's expensive to go down there at the bottom of the ocean to take it up repair it and everything so um, things happen defects occur and that one had gone through non-destructive testing hydrostatic testing still got to the field that doesn't happen very often that's a little unusual but in any case these guys for this refinery wanted to purchase the pipe they purchased it to the hydro test because that's what is required but the hydro test says except as provided in these other three paragraphs right beneath it beneath it it says when specified by the purchaser it shall be permissible for pipe to be tested by non-destructive electric test you don't know what that is and neither did I when I first read it you have to read a little further or when specified in the order the pipe shall be furnished without hydrostatic test in which case you got to note it as NH for non hydrostatic okay so someone might be using this for some structural application in a building they're not going to pressurize it internally um, in any case there are some exceptions non-destructive electric test which it talked about up here well it turns out non-destructive electric is how these code guys decided to define ultrasonic eddy current or magnetic particle which they call flux leakage okay and it warns you that the hydrostatic test in section 13 has the capability of finding defects of a size permitting uh, the test fluid to leak okay so whatever this means it's a little little fuzzy but it should be able to find flaws is what it's telling you um, but then it's talking about the other tests like the flux leakage and it basically says if you find any flaw greater than 12 and a half percent of the thickness of this steel of the wall you're gonna have to reject it well now we have a little bit of conflict within the same spec because the hydro test is only done at about 40 percent of yield but the non-destructive test is looking for something that's 12 and a half percent loss 
Well, this is Never Never Land between 87.5% and 40%, where you could fail one but pass the other, right? You could pass the hydro even if it had a 50% wall defect. They purchased it to the hydro. The company found one leaking pipe when they were doing some tests, and they decided all 600 were bad. Uh, or actually, I'm sorry, they, they found one leaking pipe, they had a metallurgist do some uh, metallography, said, oh, it had a defect in it. Okay, um, it was in a little end, okay, wasn't a couple inches long. I wouldn't want to put it in service, it, it was a, definitely a defect. And somehow it had gotten through the whole system of hydro and stuff. They had someone then go do the non-destructive electric test that were not called out in the purchase order, which are more than twice as stringent as the hydrostatic, hydrostatic tests they paid for. Remember, this thing in my outline is, you should only get what you pay for. Well, now they said, oh, since we found one defect out of 600 pipes, and it was only in one little three inch section of a, these are 40 foot long sections. So you multiply 600 times, uh, 40 and get whatever how many feet of that is and you got a three inch length on however many feet of that is That's the only defect they found. They did find some other things um, They claimed That some of those exceeded the 12 and a half percent limit But several of us went on site last August, a year ago August and we looked at all <coughs> 600 lengths of pipe. Let me tell you it's a lot of fun. Okay uh, looking at 600 lengths of pipe, but um, it would pay for one year of one, one student in college, so it's not so bad. Um, and we couldn't find a single defect that exceeded the 12.5%. So now we're in an argument about was there a 12.5% defect? And even if there was, you only ordered it to 40% strength. So now you want 87.5% strength? Well, what's the price? Well, this was originally probably a couple million dollars worth of pipe or less. And they want $60 million in return because half the pipe had already been fabricated and put into the refinery. And they decided, oh, well, we can't tolerate a failure in the refinery. So we're going to rip all that out and put some new stuff in. So that escalates the cost from, a, you know, a few millions of dollars of pipe to, you know, tens of, tens of millions of, of dollars of pipe. And so there's controversy and it's because Various engineers can't read and interpret that single code. Forget all the other codes it references. They can't even interpret the English language of that code. Okay? So, you get into uh, lots of interesting fights. Okay, I'll see you. Uh, you're going to do a video on Monday, right? Okay. And I'll see you on Tuesday and we'll talk about some more of these things. Okay?